So my name is Jacqueline Jones. I lead strategic partnerships globally for our diversity, inclusion, and belonging group at LinkedIn. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here. LinkedIn's mission is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. Every member. And every day I get up just giving thanks that I have this job and giving thanks that I get to do this every day. So as the person who leads strategic partnerships, um, my job is to form relationships with the largest organizations um, in the country and the world that are champions for diverse populations. I approached LinkedIn about six years ago saying, hey, you guys are about um, creating a digital footprint of the global economy. What if you know black people knew about this? What if women knew about this? What about Latinos, LGBT, all these different segments knew about this? And voila, <laughs> they're like, go do it. So um, with that said, I'd like to kick off tonight by introducing three women, which I am rapidly considering friends, actually. We just met tonight, but we've like basically got like fell in love with each other a little bit. So I'm going to ask Molly, Faton, and Ripa to come up on stage and join me. <laughs> Thank you. We have a tradition here. You got to say what's not on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> <laughs> make it good. Make it, you know. Mm. Mine is um, I am the bossy little sister of five. But I am the youngest. But if you saw us all in the room, you'd assume I'm the oldest. And that carries on to my professional career as well. I like it. Uh, mine is, I could probably win you are playing football, which we call soccer. Oh. Yeah, I, I played in high school and got scholarship to college as well on playing football. That's not on my uh, LinkedIn, though. Love it, so you're fierce. Uh, yes. <laughs> really hard to follow, thank you. <laughs> my one's, um, I have lived and worked in, on every continent except for Africa and Antarctica. And hope to fill in one of those two gaps before. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to Ghana for Ghana Tech Summit, oh, so you can join me. I'll come with you. All right. <laughs> what do you want to create in this room tonight? Emotional connections. Okay. Cool. Uh, to know that you're not alone. There's always somebody there that's sitting in that same boat as you. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, inspiration. We can do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not off the hook. Um, I'm creating solutions. Yep. So I want you to listen from the standpoint of what you know I can do, what we can do together. You lead these rooms, and you have a, you have an assignment, you know. But we're up here to give you some things to think about. Yeah. Yes. Love All it. right. So let's just let's jump right let's in. Do this. Let's jump right in. So um, we've heard all about the great work that Empower does. Um, why? How did we get here? Like, what are the drivers as far as having low numbers of women of color in the workforce? Like, it's a very complex problem. We're not going to solve it tonight, but just at least just to set the table um, of why this is so. So I have a funny pitch about this. Um, there's an amazing podcast from NPR called What Happened to All the Women Coders? And it shows a photo of Bell Labs, Oakland, 1960, I mean, 79, I believe. And it's just women, right? And it looks like hidden figures. Mm -hmm. And the original coders were women, right? Those original coders. But as coding became statistical and analytical, then it became complex. It, it was man's work then, right? And so they started to correlate and look back at history and say, well, what happened? And they started to follow specifically women getting college degrees. So coming out of the home in the 50s and 60s, going into the workforce and getting degrees, whether it's like in becoming lawyers or doctors. Um, and then all of a sudden, they see this downtick in the late 80s where women stopped pursuing computer science. And they Why correlated it back to, and I blame the marketers, and I used to be a marketer, so sorry, <laughs> but how we marketed computers into the home in the early 80s. So when computers went to the home in the 80s, they said, do we sell it on the pink aisle next to Barbie or the blue aisle? Mm -hmm. And they started to sell computers mm -hmm. as a vehicle for video games. And the ad said things, things like, it's not your dad's PC. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and here are the images of boys. So they weren't even marketing to women. And then think about, and so that correlated into once the guys got to college, the first year of university, they know how to code. They've been exposed to computers. I think of my own CEO, Mark Benioff. He sold his first video game to Atari at the age 15. Mm -hmm. But think about the digital divide and that gap of, yeah. you know, we had one VCR. My brother took it apart. He got a whooping. Right? He didn't go to MIT. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, but think about that when there's a market that's saying, we're targeting boys, yeah. we're a, a video game you know, vehicle, we're in the blue aisle, and then all of a sudden girls show up to university and get this message. You, know, you show up in a room and when you're the only one, you go, mm, guess I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah. Right? So I personally think education failed us, ladies. Wow. That's my two cents. All right. All right. I'm <laughs> learning stuff up here. This is fantastic. <laughs> Uh, for me, I think uh, to bring it to the space of what corporations and companies have done for many years, and that is continuously going to the same universities, the same place, recruiting over and over, um, and not stepping to the space that have people that look like us. Mm. And then the other thing is just coming to the place of even branding and expecting us to understand when we haven't been given the opportunity, right? So I think for me is that if we don't change or shift the way that we recruit, mm. the way that we interview and change the construct of that, you tend to feed and weed out people that do look like us and that have the backgrounds like ourselves. So that's why I think when you look at the workforce, there's not many women that are sitting in that space. I didn't even mm. know Accenture existed in 2004 when I joined. But that was because my fam my fa I'm from West Africa. Yes. My mom worked two, three jobs. We weren't focused on that. We were focused on living and earning. And so you don't really pay attention to it until you're in the mode you're trying to survive and, not, and you're not thriving at the time. Yeah. So that's why I think we're, we're in this place we're in now. Yeah. So it's like um, exposure. Yeah. It's, it's recruiting, yeah. going to the same places, you know, build like that. That reinforcing whole cycle of networking. Yeah. Because if you look at if the space has always been either white or male, the universities have been, then yes. what happens with those who are in uh, the leadership roles? They're white and male. Yes. And so then, oh, I can refer my friend that looks like me. And that's right, because network builds off things that you have shared interest in. So at the end of the day, if you continuously go to MIT, UC Berkeley, go to Georgia Tech, I went to Georgia Tech, but you continuously go to those schools and not necessarily focus in the communities where we are going. Even HBCUs, they hadn't been going until more recently, right? Wow, so, wow. Yep. That's amazing. Ripa? Well, I have a slightly different perspective in that I didn't grow up in the US, and as a girl, I never thought twice about being good at science or math. And I came to the US to study astrophysics, and it was only when I got to college that I realized what a unicorn I was. Mm. Um, and it made me realize that, you know, and I hadn't grown up in a consistent culture, which is probably why I was kind of comfortable with rule breaking and not even knowing that yeah. I was breaking any rules, right? I didn't know what rules to break. But once I got to the U.S., and I've lived here now in the U.S. for most of my adult life, it's really troubling to me the masculinization of the STEM careers, which I have never grown up with. Um, and of course, it's extreme in the tech space, yeah. particularly. So I think that's something we really need to grapple with. Uh, I used to, one of the roles I had um, in my fairly diverse career was heading up um, diversity and inclusion for Time Warner, the media company. And during my time there, I also realized what a role, big role the media plays in our vision mm -hmm. of who we can be. You know, if you can see it, you can be it. Yeah. There's so many versions of it, right? And um, you know, if, if any of you have seen some of the work done by Gina, the Gina Davis Institute, they really track different aspects of gender stereotypes that are perpetuated by our media. And um, the representation of women in technology roles, in STEM roles, et cetera, actually shapes the way girls imagine who they can be. And it's shifted recently because of some of the data we've seen on the big gaps. Still, big gaps exist. But we have seen, for instance, what's known as the CSI effect of women going into forensic sciences more because of portrayals of women, uh, as well as minorities. So, but there are still massive gaps in representation of media, 
which both reflects and shapes society. So that's one wonderful piece. Two is culture. And you know, I have a background also as an anthropologist. I was going through the alphabet, you know, asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, for me, it really also is about culture because it's when I confronted a very different culture coming to the United States that I hit the barriers of, you're a woman. I don't know if anyone dared say in my face, you're a woman of color, because race is much more complicated to talk about than gender, right? Um, but all of those things clearly uh, befuddled everybody. Yeah. yeah. What do we do about this? Like, what do companies do? So, I, so much. I think <laughs> companies have a responsibility here, right? Yeah. Um, at Salesforce, we say businesses are a platform for change. We have to use this opportunity to make a few changes. I think, first of all, it's working on your company culture, right? So how do you make it, like I tell, we have our employee resource group, Salesforce Women's Network, and I tell them, if we hire 2,000 women this year, it's your job to make them stay. Okay. Yep. How do we provide community for one another? How do we support one another? Find your mentor, find your network. You know, find that community. So I think that's important that companies have that role to play as well as the individuals. Um, I think we, that recruiting stance, okay. where are we looking for talent, right? Yeah. How are yeah. we grooming talent? And then how do we make sure we're growing that talent and looking at the ta talent throughout the pipeline, right? Yeah. It's not just the entry level positions. And then I think something that a lot of companies are not talking about or doing, and we've got to do a better job of returnship. So re-entry to the workplace, right? We literally just have to make the door wider to make their greater opportunity. What about moms who step away from their careers? How do they get back in, right? It's really, it's really a difficult thing. We're piloting a program with our legal organization to say, you know, a lawyer's a lawyer, right? right? Your so skills you don't go away. away. <laughs> right, so you, you, you might wanna say, well, you missed this coding app or you missed that, but we're like, a lawyer's a lawyer. So you can step away and then come back and practice yeah. law, right? And we're careful not to call them interns, right? So we're, we're careful to call it a returnship. That's awesome. Anybody else want to jump in? I'm yeah, talk about well, if I might. I'm no, go for it. All right. Um, I mean, I come at this very much from the inclusion mm -hmm. perspective. Um, I've spent you know, the last 15 years of my career trying to figure out the balance between diversity and inclusion. And my colleague, Dr. Laura Sherbin, who heads up my car, uh, you know, we head up this um, boutique consulting and research organization called Culture at Work. We published a piece two years ago really summarizing our research findings about this. I will start though with a simple memorable quote by Brene Myers around diversity and inclusion. Who Brene. hears her? Yeah. Brene. Who hears <laughs> so, Those who heard it, please bear with me. And those who haven't, hopefully you'll remember it. She defines diversity as being asked to the party and inclusion as being asked to dance. She usually accompanies this of a photo of a middle school, high school dance with all the pimply kids standing on the edges of the door not being asked to dance. <laughs> so you can make it into the party, but if you're not asked to dance, you're not really included. I, you know, I, I, I do a lot of wonderful discussions like this, and earlier in the year, I was speaking to a room full of lawyers, actually, and um, the session was moderated by the first and only female black partner at a white shoe law firm. And she said, you know, I've heard the Verne thing a million times and it's great, but I want to add to it. So I'm going to quote her. And she said, you know, diversity is being asked to the party, inclusion is being asked to dance, and real belonging is changing the playlist. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Because, you know, you may yep. not like the songs that are playing. Yep. <laughs> you should be so okay with like, changing the song. Yeah, because, you know, sometimes we are, need to be yeah. part of the culture shift. It's Absolutely. It's not just about yeah. us fitting in. It's about us evolving the culture. And you know, something on belonging, because that's, that's actually built into the, um, the title of our department at LinkedIn. Okay. Belonging, when people belong, that's when the true innovation occurs, yeah. mm -hmm. right? They're mm -hmm. contributing, they feel like they have a stake in the game. This is, it's magic occurs when somebody actually belongs and invests in the environment. Um, so I actually want to double down on the point that you made. Um, and I'll throw this open to everyone. How do we create an environment that women of color thrive? Like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not into doing well. I'm into thriving. Like, how do we create that environment? I think for me, it's focusing, focusing on coming and building your table. And at that table, it means having your own board of directors and looking out into the diverse space for mentors and sponsors that don't necessarily look like you, um, and being open to reaching out and vocalizing 
Another thing is being real intentional in the relationships that you develop. Um, I've been part of our, our, I've led our women's ERG now in the NorCal area for about three years. Yes. And prior to that in Atlanta for about 10 years. And the focus of that was really on bringing more young women into tech. Because when I got into it, I was the only one, one of uh, the few at Georgia Tech. And then coding in Java, I'm the only one sitting at a table. So, but in order for me to develop and make sure that my legacy is the way that I want it to be, is I have to look back and bring others along with me. So getting into spaces that actually enable me to do that is why I'm sitting in the role I'm in now as an HR business partner. Um, because I, I wasn't in HR before. I was a technologist. But at the end of the day, in order to change policy and go, I told my family is going in and being, doing the covert mission. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of coming in there and actually seeing what is happening. You hear from the outside all the time. But what do our numbers look like? What can we tactfully do in order to change those metrics, the gaps? Why are all of our African Americans sitting longer before they get on our projects? Why do our, our pipeline mm -hmm. only have white males? Why are we pushing back on our recruiters? Yeah. You can't come to me without having 50-50. I love it. Right? And you can't come to me without having an African American or Hispanic American in your list, why would you do things like that? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause <laughs> you just that. for a Man, second. Yeah. But being you know, real, right? <laughs> real, because you started this discussion with real, right? So right. you heard a lot in terms of what companies can do. Like she will not fill a position without having a diverse slate. It's like stop, the the slate you is nonsense, yeah. right? Absolutely. And we That's we awesome. encourage recruiters to do like you. They know not to come with that list. And we're specifically <laughs> looking for African American, Hispanic American, because we have to close the gap. When you look mm -hmm. at the certifications within Salesforce, SAP, AWS, all of them, majority of the certifications sit with men. Mm -hmm. And so we need them as allies, right? Because they will help us build that community and that network. So at the end of the day, if they're the mentors that we need, then we set up initiatives and programs to allow them to be in that space and support them with money as well. And Love that it. means bringing all of our women along the way and seeing where are the gaps in order to train them and support them. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Like, how do we create an environment that women of color thrive? I think we're still at a point where people don't realize that women of color have a different journey in corporate America, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And, and I really, I'm going to say some, some triggering words here, right? Same. I mean, it's one thing to say, men, we need you to be our allies. But I have to take it a step further and say, white women, I need you to be my ally, mm -hmm. right? The Wall Street Journal Women in the Workplace study that came out with McKinsey two weeks ago, mm -hmm. they literally are saying, pay attention to women of color, specifically black women, Latinx women, women with disabilities, and LGBTQ women. Why is that? Because they're saying we're not having the same experience yeah. as others. Right? And I think that realization needs to happen. It's kind of like you said, we can talk about gender all day long, but no one wants to talk about race. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? I need you to acknowledge that my journey is different in corporate America than yep. different in your, mm. than your journey. Right? How many women of color have that performance review come around? And I already admitted to you all that I'm bossy, right? <laughs> Molly's assertive. She's aggressive. She's aggressive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know the words. I know aggressive. I, yeah, my Asian sisters, you didn't speak up. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, you're not collaborating. You know, you, you hear those code buzzwords. Word, those right. Yes, yeah, right. those coded words mm -hmm. that you're like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. I know what you yep. mean. Right, and so I think that, that I don't think a lot of organizations are there yet or that other people are saying, wow, how do I be your ally? And allyship is not a romantic comedy where it's this big <laughs> gesture and someone's singing out your window. Nope. It's something as simple as, I think you spoke over her and she had something Absolutely. to say. Absolutely. Right? Yep. It's making space for other people. Yeah. It's making sure their ideas are heard or that they're credited for their ideas. Yeah. It's little things. It's not big gestures. Yes. So I think at some point we all have to realize our privilege, right? I have the privilege of I'm extroverted. I'm talkative. Yeah. I can own a room. Mm. How do I give that privilege to someone else? How do I make space for someone else? So I still feel like we're on this journey where people aren't realizing, oh, you've got it different than, say, a majority culture person. But now I realized that early in my career, though, with uh, 
Uh, to, to your point earlier about growing up in a space where you didn't, I didn't even have to think about being a girl or a woman. I grew up in a matriarch society where you could do anything you wanted to do. So coming to the US and, and somebody telling me I can't is not like something that's foreign to me. But what I er realized really early on is that whole board of directors thing. White women needed to be part of my team, to be Thanks. frank. I have some really awesome mentors and sponsors that have supported me throughout my career and that will stand to bat, and that sit in that space. Even leading the women's ERG is always the conversation, of, but it's all women. No, at the end of the day, our Latin American women have a different experience, African American, even African women yeah. have a different experience. It's the culture and all of that that comes behind you and how do we support the diaspora women that are at the table. I'd like to change the frame a little bit, if sure. I might, and expand it to what corporations can do, yes. because a lot of what yes. we're talking about is advocating for ourselves, and that's, we're already are really busy and tired, right? So that's like on top of being tired to becoming super tired, which we all are anyways. <laughs> we'll talk but, about that too. <laughs> we can talk, we're going to talk about that now. Uh, but I want to kind of really address what you said about the McKinsey data. You know, I've been in this space looking at the data in terms of the numbers to the pipeline for years, and that makes me tired too mm -hmm. because they haven't moved. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But what was a real eye-opener for me for this latest data point is the fact that the leakiness of the pipeline to leadership is predominantly owing to the leakiness of multicultural women. Mm -hmm. So going back to your earlier question of what can corporate America do to include us, they're not doing enough but I think what they can do is create environments where our difference is a superpower, yep. <laughs> where we're valued, we're seen, we're heard, and why learning about each other is critical because there's a lot behind our faces and our voices inside us that each of us is distinctive and we bring to the table that isn't visible based on stereotypes that we may be uh, pigeonholed into. I will say though, in the work that we've done for the people who are representing the corporations here, there is actually a science to creating a more inclusive culture. This is not rocket science, I can say that as the astrophysicist, but there is a science. And the science is really, there are four key dimensions that you can measure and track. Yeah. So thank you for talking about the numbers. Absolutely. But it's not just the lagging indicators, there are leading indicators that you need to be tracking. One is around how inclusive are your leaders? Yeah. Are they enacting those behaviors you talked about, meaning giving the quiet voices um, a voice, mm -hmm. sharing success, giving candid feedback, soliciting feedback? So we've documented that. So how inclusive are your leaders? And every organization we've done this in, even the most progressive, we find that leaders, over 80% of them, consider themselves pretty inclusive based mm -hmm. on those behaviors. And my joke is always, who are those some percent who don't think they're inclusive, yeah. right? What are they doing? Anyway. Um, but the percentage of employees who feel they're leaders in the same organization are inclusive according to those very behaviors, much lower. Always a gap, and we need to close that gap. So one's inclusive leaders. Two is um, how narrow are the leadership archetypes in your organization? Do all your leaders look the same and mm. feel the same? Or is there a broad array of styles um, both demographic representation, et cetera, and other forms of diversity. And how comfortable do you feel bringing yeah. your full self, bringing your difference to the table? Not every environment encourages that. Mm -hmm. Third factor, relationship capital. We, we're gonna talk a lot more well, about, that, about that, <laughs> so I won't go belabor that, but really is kind of a, the most critical currency you can cultivate it's like, it's like money. It's capital. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's capital. Mm -hmm. It's what you, what you uh, build, you create, you invest yeah. wisely and strategically. And the last piece is really how and where we do work, the value proposition of work, right? Where it fits into life, how it's structured, how we create meaning out of it, um, all of those aspects. So when you look at those four pieces, and culture is hard to quantify, but that's what the mission is, at least. <laughs> what keeps me up at night is trying to quantify and track some of these leading indicators. We've really found with some leading companies that that goes a long way towards creating the environment where everyone can thrive. This is amazing. This is such a great panel. <laughs> um, this is a marathon. 
yeah. right? This is not a sprint, you know? How do you take care of yourselves? I have people at work that hold me accountable, or folks I can text and, and sharing my success and all that. So I think that that's what's important to me to keep that, what you might call your board of directors, yeah. to keep that around me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I always, this is pitiful, but I always make sure I have a vacation to look forward to. Yeah. I call that my like finish line. I need that like <laughs> carrot out there where I'm like, okay, just when I could get to that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I've got to do better you practice of self care. You got your yeah. list. Yeah. Mine is, honestly, mine is my family. I always mm -hmm. like, there, that's a tribe, and when I say family, it's not just the people that are related by blood. It's honestly all those that are behind me who have said wonderful things I can go and cry to or yes. whatever it is, but that's the relationship. But more importantly, at, for me at work, to on my day-to-day, -day, I literally have on my calendar where I block off my 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning because my son's school started at 8.20. Yes. And I did not want to be that person with my headset on, um, trying to drop them off and being on a conference call when everybody else knows it's 8.20 in the Bay and school's letting in. So I have my 7.30 to 8.30 blocked off. 4.30 to 8.30 p.m. is blocked off as well, because at the end of the day, I need to have that. And the thing is, when you do those little things, it encourages others to approach you that way. And then you're not just opening up yourself to whatever is out there, because people will take from you unless you actually truly put it out there on what it is that your boundaries are. And I guarantee you, people will tend to respect those. But putting it out there and not being afraid to do so, that's yeah. sort of how I take care of myself. And if I'm not feeling up to it, you raise my hand. And that, that somebody is always willing yes. to support. Yes. That's what I know, that they, you just need to say it. Oftentimes, you realize you've made it up more than you realize, right? Made it bigger than it really is, and that somebody's really willing to support. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that it's, it's super important that we all pay attention to that. We have some questions in the video. We have questions in the room. You want to do a video question, and I'll have you okay. afterwards? I can ask later, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and these are from NPower students. Hi, my name is Anita. I've recently started my tech career and I love it, but I'm struggling to navigate the corporate environment. Do you have any advice on how to observe and absorb the nuances? Ladies. Hmm. I'm, I'm very much an extrovert, okay? But when at work, I tend to just sort of listen mm -hmm. and read the room, especially on pro you know, for ex at Accenture, we move from project to project, right? So within that first few weeks of being there, mm -hmm. it is my job to take my little tool belt and just sort of assess what's happening, you know, hold back a bit, and then it's time to actually express and voice what it is that I think or directionally. Because you don't want to come in feeling, uh, you put people on defense mm -hmm. when you come in just off the bat trying to change everything. Change management, you just need to kind of understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> understand who the stakeholders are <laughs> and how they operate. Do I connect with them on football, soccer? Are they from Trinidad, Jamaica, or are they from Denmark? <laughs> <laughs> and, and use those tethers to drive conversation. Because I think you mentioned about relationships. Relationships should not just be on the surface. You have to go deeper. And in order for you to sort of move through the corporate environment. I think being intentional about the relationships and taking them just a little deeper than the surface helps to move and navigate. Awesome, awesome. Any other, Any other advice? I'd echo that in terms of observing, but also really building um, the mentor and sponsorship relationships in yeah. a deliberate way. I think thinking through your mentor and sponsor and all the other people in your relationship map, including allies, mm -hmm. as literally your cultural GPS mm -hmm. for an organization. When you go to a new country, guidebook, videos, that doesn't exist always for the workplace. So you have to rely on people. These are going to be your cultural GPS for work. And um, you know, a sponsor takes a little more time, but mentors and allies can kick in pretty quickly, the first cohort that starts with you, those are your immediate allies. And I agree with you around looking um, beyond the face in the mirror. You might have soccer in common, you might 
have travel in common. Yeah. You might have food in common. Everyone has food in common, yep. right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so really, I remember a PwC partner, <clears throat> well, she was a black woman, said to me her first mentor was a Caucasian man, and they were as different as can be. He was from Connecticut. She had grown up in the inner city. All the kind of stereotypes played in terms of their backgrounds. But in the Bay Engine, when they first got on the same project, she said, I didn't know what I was going to do, how I was going to forge any connection. It turned out they were really, really passionate about tr culinary travel, something really obscure, you know, like <laughs> going to Oaxaca. Yeah. <laughs> and they bonded on that and remained friends and colleagues and allies for many years after that. So she always said, look beyond the face in the mirror because there's something. Oh, I love that. Ask questions. Ask, I mean, that's the first lesson of any leadership, <laughs> yeah. right? Listen, ask yeah. questions, share. That's awesome. Yeah. And Literally coach. asking somebody to be your mentor or your sponsor. People don't say that. But I've had more men or guys ask me outright to be a mentor or a sponsor than women have. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I'm on Women's ERG lead, mm -hmm. right? So I am like so into our women. I'm like, we, I'm all about it all day, every day. You understand? She's excited. <laughs> but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. vocalizing and being intentional, because sponsors are the ones who are going to be in a room who has influence and can talk about you when you're not there. So yep. understanding where those people are and where they sit is so critical. And mentors are great. I think they are, you need both, yes. mentors and sponsors. For me, showing up and being consistent, because my work will speak, <clears throat> right? But being consistent, because if somebody's gonna go to bat for my, for, and putting their career on the line, essentially that's what they're doing, right? Is I need to be consistent in what I'm doing, what I'm bringing to the table. So if I'm, if I'm in that place of consistency, then I look for others who have similar nature. Um, one of the things that I leaned into very early on was, um, again, the Women's CRG, our sponsor at the time. And the focus there was not, I, I saw her speak, and I was like, who is this woman? I need to go figure out what she's about. And I'm like stalking her internet trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> did you go on LinkedIn? Did you? Did of you, course. Okay. That's yeah. what you did. <laughs> but at the end of the day was finding that tether or finding that space where I could open up the conversation mm -hmm. and then volunteering to do things to support her mm -hmm. and in, encourage and um, guide whatever initiative or program she's trying to do, I was there. Awesome. And then a after a while, that's what consistency gets built in, right? She's seeing me consistently show up, consistently supporting her efforts, because then when she rises, I get to rise with her. And that's how I focus on building a sponsor, <clears throat> sponsorship. But the, uh, the, the idea is that she's actually in my org, right? And if I'm getting promoted, she is actually someone who has the ability to promote me and to move me to the next level. Mentor is someone else. They're giving you advice on how to take that opportunity or an opportunity and move it forward. A sponsor is actually giving you opportunities and have the capability and the voice and the policy or they hold, they hold those head counts in their space to be able to take it forward. I love everything she said, but here's what I would add to that. I get a lot of invitations, hey Molly, can we have a coffee, right? Every, first of all, everyone's <laughs> flattered if you ask them to be your mentor, yeah. period. Anyone's flattered. But these coffee dates, I don't have time for coffee with everybody. Uh -huh. <laughs> I already have five direct reports, so I need to be coffeeing with them, right? So I believe you need to come to a mentor. A couple things I would say. What problem are you trying to solve? I very much reached out to someone and said, I have a very young team that I need to grow and develop their career, and it's not a promotion, it's development opportunities. Mm -hmm. I heard you're good at that. Can you coach me? Right? Very specifically, what do you want? I had a woman in our New York office, she happened to be a black woman as well, and she said, hey, I want you to be my mentor, I'm flattered. We set up a once a quarter Friday call. The first call we get on, she said, I'm an executive assistant, I'd like to move into the business. I said, great, 
I don't know how to do that. But I know an EA who moved into the business, I'm going to introduce you to her. And then she says to me, well, is she black too? Uh, what does that matter? <laughs> what does that matter? Again, I like my squad. I got a black girl at work. I can, hey, what's up, Leah? How you doing? I have that, right? But, but, but I'm going to say to you, please go get a mentor that doesn't look like you. Because of course you should have multiple mentors, right? But go get one that doesn't look like you. And I like to say, white men clearly know how this game works. So they clearly need to be all of our mentors, OK? So get you a white cisgender male mentor. Get you a squad mentor. And then the other piece of advice I'd give about a mentor, because that whole sponsorship thing, I didn't know that. And wait, how do I find a sponsor? And, and do I ask you to be my sponsor? What I tell my team is, find yourself a mentor that's senior to you, but somehow is in the sphere of your work that they see you and see your work. So my, one of my first career sponsors was someone that I was supporting as her PR business partner, right? So she saw me in rooms where I was working. So when she gave me feedback and coaching, it was like, hey, the way you did this or the way you sh showed up here. So that's what I would say, try to cultivate that amongst people that see your work. Yeah. And then I love your definitions, right? That was awesome. This is great. This is great. So we're going to go Can to one I of the. Add very quickly yeah. to this oh, sure, matter. sure. I mean, again, I you know I think you're you guys said so much of it. I just wanted to leave people with a, a formal definition because I just did a webinar on this topic today, and I I do them all the time, and I've been doing the research on this. Um, you know, research sponsorship across eleven geographies, mm -hmm. and basically a sponsor and a mentor are very different, and I think in the following way. There are three big differences. One, uh, sponsorship has to be earned. It's the kind of people observing you, you do stuff for them. You can just go into an organization and be assigned a mentor. It doesn't have to be earned. I mean, sure, you've earned your strategy. You really don't have to prove yourself as much. Secondly, um, sponsorship is really about advancement. And it's not just a one-way thing mm -hmm. because typically a mentor can give you advice and it's up to you whether you take it or not right you can say okay that sounded right that didn't sound right etc sponsorship is much more invested it's much more reciprocal mm -hmm. and it's a lot more um, has more accountability mm -hmm. so those are three differences yeah, yeah. Um, very very different and please I think one thing is I, I'm appalled to hear that people are saying can will you be my sponsor because that is really not something we encourage people to do. You earn it. And it's only after some time that you can actually That consistency someone. factor. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I encourage people to do some an exercise, which is really kind of make a, make a page with four quadrants in it and put sponsor, mentor, ally, and um, you know people who report to you, followers. And see, put a couple of names in each box. And if your sponsor box is totally empty, think who's in your mentor box who you can convert into a sponsor, because that's often a great path. Or an ally who's more senior and in the position of power who you can convert. Love that, love anyway. that. So let's go to one of the questions. Hello, my name is Drea, and I work at Accenture Hello. with Watto. And there's a whole team of us here. Hi, girl. Oh, oh. Yes. Squad. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here. As Guato was a leader that when I first joined the firm, um, her, your authenticity and your brilliance and the way you just showed up really inspired me to do the same. So thank you. So my question is, um, as a, I would be considered an inclusion and diversity leader at Accenture, but it would be on a volunteer basis. So okay. this is my plus one curricular. Now, my question to the panel is, how do I inspire the executives, leaders at all levels, not just executives, to really see this as not a plus one, but something that is so integral to the business, something that adds value to the bottom line? Because I found that a select few of people are passionate and um, you know, we go off and we form these great committees, but then how are we recognized as more than just a plus one or a one off? So, thank you. Any hmm. answer? I could take it if you want. <laughs> I think at the end of the day is, show, you talked about the bottom line. Um, I joke often to our ERGs that you gotta follow the money. Mm -hmm. And the money is determining what value it brings. For me, the ERGs, if 
a company is not leaning into their ERGs, you are surely behind. Because at the end of the day, like Drea said, these are people who are passionate about that particular th thread or tether. They're the ones who are connected. So finding the value that it brings to the organization is key. One example of that is with the Women's ERG. One of the main, my main objectives is going early in our pipeline. Like when I say early, I mean like elementary, junior high, and focusing on how we can bring that early on. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, because by the time they get university, it's, a, it's too late for that, right? But forming that relationship and then understanding how we can bond that together, that value is how I show that Accenture should bring some money to the table for me to form that relationship. There's a, a high school in um, Fruitvale in the Oakland area that I have a personal relationship with. And in order for me to kind of bring that and tie that together, I took the funds and the authority that I have for the Women's ERG to leverage that and tie that into that relationship where I have high school students coming to our Salesforce hub to see. Sometimes people haven't even seen it yet. And I showed the value that it could bring. If we start early in the pipeline, this whole thing of not having uh, enough people of color in the pipeline, we can close that gap as much as possible when you go to the front. So showing value is one thing I would say and where the where that leads to the bottom line. That's awesome. Oh, Eddie, go, go ahead. Go I think ERGs need to move to, we, we call ours equality groups, mm -hmm. or employee resource groups need to move to business resource groups, right? So the first thing I would tell you is, I love people who are like, I'm passionate about diversity. Step one, do your job. Yep. Number one, kill it at your job because that's gonna build your reputation, period. Then when you get to your plus one job, our employee resource groups are tasked with four things. Inclusion, right? Find that network, find that tri tribe. Um, philanthropy, so how are you volunteering with the customer? Yep. We call it circling a school. Yep. Um, the third thing is professional development. What are you doing to help employees thrive? Your lunch and learn shouldn't be, this is a, you know, let's go have fun and dance. Your lunch and learn should be about career development Absolutely. or conversation like yeah. this, women of color in the workplace. How are you actually helping folks thrive? And the fourth thing we task them with is allies. How do you bring allies along? And so you've got to find your allies in your professional you know, networks. And I'm going to embarrass one of my exec sponsors here of Ability Force, which is our employee resource group for persons with disability, Craig Cuffey. Awesome. And Craig starts Thank at the you. company, and you don't know his journey, you have to ask. Yeah. And then if you ask Craig, he will tell you he's passionate about helping those with autism. So he gets with our employee resource group Ability Force, and they were literally all over the, how do we make our events inclusive? What's this? What's that? And Craig's like, let's focus. Let's come up with some priorities, and more importantly, let's help the business. So now they're leading autism at work. What's the journey of a person with autism at Salesforce? How would you hire them? Is recruiting and manager set up to interview them? What is their experience? How are our products accessible, right? So they're taking a real business problem for Salesforce yeah. and helping solve it. So it's not enough to be passionate and want to go to the pride parade. What are you doing to drive business value is what's yeah, needed with ERGs. Yeah. I mean, we've heard the studies from like the McKinsey's of the world mm -hmm. that, you know, that diverse teams win. Right. You actually make more money when you have diverse teams. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And can I, can I, Yes. Yes. I would be remiss, oh. Molly, if I didn't point out some of the Accenture team that helped me with that yes. journey. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. excellent. Mr. Daniel Cole. Right. Yes. That's our African American ERG lead excellent. right there. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, you. Mm. Thank you. I just wanted to add one thing that I've always Sis. remembered um, in this space around what you really are asking is what's the business case and why, you know, because. If you make a business case for it, people should be joining, right? And we've made the business case for a long time, long time. but somehow we need to keep repeating it over yeah. and over again. But I do think it bears repeating over and over again. And I very deliberately wore green today because it's the color of money. And <laughs> because we need to make more and more leaders look at us and not see a problem or niche or this. Yeah. We need to see, we're the mainstream, we are money. We are money when it comes to talent, we are money when it comes to markets, we are money when it comes to innovation. Okay. So remember, go we're green. Great. Yes, go to Mike. I think we have time Please, for, how, uh, we have time for yes. two more questions. Awesome. 
Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, this is Nurai. Uh, I am a feminist activist. Yeah. And diversity and inclusion strategist from Turkey who just moved to SF. Oh. Um, welcome. You've been singing to my heart. Thank you so much. <laughs> And my question is about psychological safety. Mm -hmm. um, it has a huge role in sustaining truly uh, inclusive environments. And as leaders, uh, there's much to do to sustain psychological safety in the teams. And research shows that uh, lack of psychological safety especially harms uh, women of color more adversely mm -hmm. because isolation, this toxic environment, microaggressions. So as leaders in your teams, what are your strategies to uh, sustain psychological safety like in your day-to-day -day business? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. what, one thing we've, we've, done, uh, we've done over the last few years is um, focus on our strengths and so developing what you, so there's the strengths finer, Gala. And so each person has, you know, the top five strengths that you, um, that your ca capacity is at, right? And understanding where others sit with that means that you can interact and collaborate accordingly. Um, building teams that have those strengths that, that are compatible with one another. Um, one of the first things that we do when I, when I have when I join a team for the first time, is going through that exercise. So know where my team sits for them to understand where I sit. Because at the end, at the end of the day, that means giving them a space and a forum to say, yeah, this is not really something that I'm like really good at. Um, but I see that you know, Jennifer is, so let's lean in more on Jennifer to do so. And I think that's one way of creating an environment that has that forum to be open and be being yourself and to be um, to be safe in that space. Yeah. Any other? No? I think it's a really tough one. I think it's really really tough as a woman of color to admit vulnerability in many workplaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so creating psychological safety often is about exposing your vulnerability. Yeah. I don't think there are any easy solutions. Mm -hmm. It's um, situational. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you know I lead I lead teams and. You know, some of the simple things I've done, very tactical, and I, you know, I talk to other leaders and tell them always, be the last one to speak. I very deliberately in meetings, mm -hmm. let mm -hmm. other people lead and don't speak until the very end. Very hard for me, because I'm a talker, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but really forcing myself to listen. So I think that that kind of silence has a lot of power, uh, and we need to deploy it in a really powerful way especially us extroverts, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but it's a very, very tough one because, um, you know, it, we aren't coming from a position of strength. Um, so I think it's, it's a double bind for us in many ways. I don't have easy solutions for you, but thank you for raising that. I think the jury's still out and we all are kind of feeling our way through what works. And I love well, I want strength finder example. Yeah. Go back to our earlier comment, which I heard, you know, that works for both introverts and ex, uh, extroverts in terms of creating your own space of psychological safety. You should always have your squad. You know, like people within an organization that you can go to, that you've made friends with, who you, you may even declare people in the organization and have that relationship. Like, you can ask me anything, you know, and offer to be that person for someone else first. And then you find that, that that reciprocates and you've almost like started to generate that for yourself. That's yeah. an empowering way of to, to start doing sure. that. Um, but I, I just wanted to leave that with you as, as, a, as a place to start. Yeah. That is so good though. Because there are a lot of yeah. women or individuals mm -hmm. at Accenture that I, I provide that space mm -hmm. for. And in turn you find that is also a space for you to be vulnerable. And I don't think I've thought of not being vulnerable. I like wear everything on my sleeve. <laughs> but generally, you know, being able to connect with others that yeah. way when you open yourself up to allowing others to come to you. Um, one thing I was worried about moving, because I just moved into HR, okay, like a month ago. Um, and the, my biggest worry was, oh man, I'm gonna go into HR. And the perception is, she's now in HR, I can't talk to black <laughs> 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 So 
So I, yeah. I've been joking around, like, think about it as me being the journalist who tells you everything is off the record. <laughs> so, that we can do, so we can truly be able to get to it because you need to talk about things that is uncomfortable, and that's yeah. okay to be able to do so. Yeah. You know, um, and, and the last point I'll make before I go to the last question, this was actually one of the most valuable. I've been here for uh, almost four years in the Valley, moved from Florida, and one of you, one of the um, most incredible experiences I've ever had was that I offered to be safe space for a white man to ask anything. Yep. Because he was just like, I want to get involved so badly, but I'm so high in the organization, I'm terrified of making a mistake. Mm. Yep. And I said, okay, with me, we'll have a relationship where you can like, ask me anything about, you know, anything about how I feel about being mentored, about feedback, about, and it turned out to be the most incredible relationship. Mm -hmm. And literally, it has changed his relationship with his daughter. Mm -hmm. It has, um, he called me up one day, like I went to, you know, New York, and I called up a chapter of the National Black MBA Association, and I offered to just like first 30 people meet me down here for free advice. And within like an hour, he had like, and this is a very, very high level executive in a, in a firm here in Silicon Valley. And he was so proud of himself for doing something mm -hmm. like that. So, um, and he learned it's bi directional, like yeah. you have yeah. so much to offer. Yeah. It's two way. Like in 20 years, this whole, not even 2040, right? Yeah. You have the whole, you know, we've heard the stat yeah. over and over and over again. It is a business imperative for companies to learn this. You will go out of business if you don't understand different sets of people. Um, to, measure, to, to learn how to uh, manage a diverse audience, like that's going to be table stakes. Do you get it? You have a lot to offer. Yeah. All right, I'll stop. Nice, last question. <laughs> Thank, you all so, Thank you all so much for your insight tonight. I found it very helpful. Uh, I'm a software engineering apprentice uh, at a tech company here in the Bay Area. And um, my question is, or um, I'm also one of the found, founding members of uh, my company's Black Employee Resource Group. Mm -hmm. And Congrats. Often what I found is Congrats. Yeah. Congrats, yeah. Often what I've found is uh, the company puts a lot of um, responsibility on the ERG to mm -hmm. lead those diversity efforts. Uh, what's an effective way to uh, put that responsibility back on the company and holding them accountable for the diversity efforts? We're looking uh, at you. Uh, Me? Yeah. Well, you're going to laugh. Um, I actually have a terrible answer for this question, right? Because I, I worked at Cisco for five years. I hate to say the company, but I am. And we, I ran the Black Employee Resource Group for two years, and we hustled all year just to have money for two programs, right? And we just hustled, hustled, hustled. Now at Salesforce, we financially empower our ERGs, and I'm going to tell you, I think they do too damn much. Every week they got something going on. I'm like, when do y'all work? <laughs> and then the feedback is, you're taxing us with all the work. Who told you to do that much work? Right? So I would say focus on how you can make a great impact. And that doesn't mean a lot of noisy things. Right? And then when you show proof point, like I'm going to give you, I'm going to put a silver lining on this, I promise. So our um, employee resource group, Bold Force, for our black employees. Yeah. In um, the New York office, they started a mentoring program, and they were kind of solving, we don't know the leaders in the office, you don't know us, this is weird. So they said, let's do a series of events where we almost do like, I'm gonna call it speed dating, but you meet people, you engage, and then afterwards, let's see the pairs that come along. So Bold Force did this in New York, and then Bold Force did this in Atlanta, and then, um, uh, Asia Pac Force decided we're going to do the same thing too. And then we were like, wait a minute, you all are spinning up the same program. Okay, then we see a need as the Office of Equality. Okay, now it's our responsibility yeah. to actually take this and make it a program, right? But they had to build a case that there was a need for this program function and a hire to program manage it, right? So it, same thing, our women's program, they were like, well, we want a women's conference. 
you can't side hustle make a women's conference no. happen. So my team took that on, right? So you just have to make the business case. But I would say as an ERG, really be focused, right? What's the one or two things we can do every quarter? Another thing we do is we have champion month for our ERGs. So like obviously February, Black History Month, Bold Force, you take that, Earth Month, Earth Force, March is Global Women's Month, so everyone has a month. We're actually telling them, you know you'd have more money if you were intersectional. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know you would have more money if you got together and did something together. Yep. Right? So I would say figure out ways to bring all your equality groups together. How do you bring your allies along and focus on fewer, more impact opportunities? And then when you have things where you're like, you know what, let's make a case to the business, we need this because. Right, and then we're and we can talk separately about how we're trying to incentivize our ERGs and give back to them. It's like we were talking about Afrotech, and I'm like, we'll give you an Afrotech ticket, but you got to work. Yep. Right. So we try to make sure there's some perks as well. I hope that's helpful, though. She touched on intersectionality. That ding, is ding, so ding, ding, ding. important when it comes to the our resource groups and partnering. I know you mentioned Daniel. Our, Daniel is our AERG lead. And it is very specific and intentional that he and I partner on a lot of things. And for, our, for this year coming up, we have consistently planned our year to make sure that when something is happening in the AA space, yep. the women are a part of it. We also have our HA that's a part of it. But that intersectionality, we can share the wealth, and sh I call it sharing the love. Mm -hmm. Because some groups get more than others. You know, depending on the percentage, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, we come together and we can make more use of our money and our time. I'm sorry, I got one more thing. Right? Yeah. I got one more thing. I'm going back to my Cisco example, I said that to say, at Cisco, we wanted an ERG because I could be in a building all day long and not see another person who looked like me. Mm -hmm. So when you say you're carrying the burden of the work, I wanted that burden because I needed to make sure I had community. So balance. I have community and we plan in full hundred activities that are real unnecessary. Yeah. Right? Intentional. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Anybody else? I think there's one, one more. One more and then then I'm getting the eye of like <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Diana. Uh, what advice would you give to a military a military spouse that's transitioning back into the work field? Oh, I love this. A military spouse. Oh, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we have to say thank you to you and your family yeah. for doing service, yeah. right? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> huh, that's a good one. Um, I feel like there's an interesting thing happening at Salesforce where we're just now having this conversation, this realization that the spouse has a different journey as well, right? Because if you have to move or relocate, it's not just about getting vets employed, but the wives and spouses of veterans being enjoyed, uh, being, uh, de being trans deployed as well, or you're moving around, right? Mm -hmm. So, Salesforce, vet force, mm -hmm. right? We have programs specifically for not only just veterans, but veterans' families. So how do you get back into the workplace? Become a Salesforce administrator. It's a job you can also do um, ex from home or anywhere in the world, right? Get with a great company. So I would say look at programs like that. So what are the programs specific to vets? I'm sure a lot of these companies are aware we've got to support the whole family as well. Same, we have, uh, we have specifically a military ERGs for that reason, um, supporting both our vets and there are spouses. I have a personal touch to it. My brother is retired from the Marines, so we've been in that whole experience before. Um, but having spaces like that for them, whereas reviewing resumes, bringing them together to see what the buzzwords to be on this particular resume, partnering with organizations, that that is their specialty, that is their subject matter expertise, partnering with them in order for us to make our programs even better. Those are things that we do to ensure and we're looking at the diaspora of the military and not just the vet, him or herself. Well, we thank you so much for the question. Thank you. This has been an amazing panel. I mean, I've learned a lot, you know, just talking with you and I've enjoyed this conversation and made three new friends. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes, yes. So everyone, please join me in thanking this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I want to um, extend my gratitude for keeping it real, 
for sharing your lived experiences and your wisdom as fierce business leaders. And you know, one of the things that, I, that is very important to us at Empower is to document the pearls that come out of conversations like this. Mm -hmm. And to that end, thanks to the great support of the City Foundation, mm -hmm. who um, funded what we call 40 by 22, which by the way, is our program to ensure that there are 40% women of color in our program by 2022, and not just as students, mm -hmm. but that 40% of our instructors at the head of the classroom are women of color. Part of that partnership with the City Foundation is to produce a research paper, first quarter, that really documents not only these conversations that are coming out of the three convenings, but some primary research that we are doing from our women alumni, as well as successful women of color who have been in the business world for many years. So please look out for that piece of research um, at the end of first quarter. We'll make sure that you all get it. Uh, but thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, thank you again for your wisdom and your time. I would encourage everybody to continue the networking and continue the conversation. And I will extend a challenge that you all did, which is to be curious. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, during the last half hour of our networking, you can just talk and ask one another the questions that are on your mind. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.